All right, welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Jen O'Sullivan. I'm a board certified doctor of naturopathy or naturopathy. I always hear it different um, pronunciations. So here on the West Coast, we pron pronounce it naturopathy. And on the East Coast, I know people tend to pronounce it naturopathy. So there you go, learn something new. Uh, all right, and then what we're gonna do is just answer your questions. So this is the Tuesdays with Jen. We've done these for uh, probably two years now. Uh, and we've kind of bounced around a little bit just based on scheduling. And so we're back on Tuesdays with Jen, which is always fun because I think we're going to stick with that through the summer as best we can. Uh, and I'm recording this onto my Dr. Jen O'Sullivan Facebook page because Facebook is no longer allowing you to go directly into groups. And so this is just a workaround so that I can then download it. But that's public. So that means you can share this out with people and anybody can watch it. So please follow that. It's my new page. Uh, some of you guys know two years ago, my page, my main page and my my main Facebook group got hacked. So we lost about a quarter of a million, a million followers, which was really, really frustrating, but that's OK. Um, and we've started over in groups that were um, not any other group, meaning uh, like the group that we started over in was a group that is a product that is no longer sold anymore. So I feel like that was a safe space. <laughs> so uh, that's all good. So. We are going to just go through the questions uh, as fast as possible, but sometimes I sit on things for a little bit longer. We are going to talk about gut health today, so I will um, start with that because it's one thing that I want to kind of give you guys different topics to just help you understand, you know, things that maybe are problematic for you. And one of the root causes that you, you know, if you fo followed any natural practitioners, natural health practitioners, uh, they will focus on gut health. They will, you know, really encourage you to work on healing your gut. Now, the problem with that is you're going to hear various uh, ideas about what that means. And so I want to give you a, a more robust understanding of your gut health and help you understand um, how to fix it. So there's some interesting studies that have been done about doing um, basically microbiome, you know, transplants. They're doing fecal transplants. So you're taking uh, fecal matter from, say, a skinny person and transplanting it into the intestinal tract of an obese person. And that microbiome of the thin person actually helps that obese person lose weight. So it's really interesting to understand that, um, you know, somebody with acne, uh, you know, they did this thing where this one gal um, was interested in fixing her microbiome. And so she did a fecal transplant with her brother, um, her brother is very healthy and he ended up, you know, giving her some of his bad microbiome. So she had to stop using his microbiome because it was causing some major issues with her that he dealt with, but she didn't think that would be a problem for her. And it was. So then she went with her boyfriend's microbiome, which was much better. Um, so it's interesting because two of the main issues that her brother dealt with that you wouldn't even think is a microbiome issue was uh, depression and acne. Now, this girl didn't have any acne at all. Uh, she had a history of depression, but she wasn't having any depression symptoms at the, at the moment and hadn't for years. She, you know, within a week of putting his microbiome into her, her depression came back with a vengeance and acne was coming all over her face. And she was like, what in the world is going on? So she stopped. And within about a week or two, all of it cleared up. And she, you know, so this is a very interesting thing to understand that there's healthy microbiome, unhealthy, mi you know, it's, it's, it's the, the microbes, right. That make up who you are. And we've talked about this from the fascinating perspective that like 90% of your body is not human. <laughs> so it's like, what in the world, your microbiome is on your skin. It's, it's in different systems. It's all over cellular matter is It could be anything from, you know, um, bacteria good bacteria, bad bacteria, even fungus, right? So these are microbes. And so it just depends on what they're there for. So like candida is a good fungus when it's, you know, operating properly. But if you overrun it, it can um, cause candida and other bad things, right? So SIBO. So one of the things to understand about your microbiome is when you are craving, say, sugar, it's not 
really any human cells. None of your human cells are necessarily craving that sugar. And, you know, we used to talk about this, that, you know, your body's made up of, you know, glucose is everywhere. Your, your blood is made up of sugar. You've got glucose basically everywhere. You know, that that's a huge thing. It's the, it's the, it's what your body uses for energy. Okay. That's all well and true, but that doesn't mean that your cells are craving it. It's the, you know, we need it. So, but when I'm talking about when you're craving like white sugar, like a donut or a cookie or something like that, that is your um, bad microbiome, your bad bacteria. Uh, I can call those like your little beasties uh, saying they're angry and they want, they want it. So like when you're trying to detox off of something and you've got all these crazy cravings and headaches and you're cranky and moody, that's your microbiome speaking, not you. So what's interesting about that is you can then do a mental shift, right? So like, instead of saying, um, I'm just craving it and that's, that's how it is. And I've got an emotional connection to food, right? We, we've kind of, we've kind of gone down that path of thinking that's what this is. And we kind of blame it. We'll blame it on maybe our, um, our thyroid or we'll blame it on our upbringing or we'll blame, blame it on emotional distress. You know, we blame it on any number of things, but the reality is the reason we have issues most of the issues we have can stem right back to your microbiome. And the problem with that is like, hear, hear me because I'm saying microbiome. I'm not saying gut. Now, a lot of your gut is meaning your intestinal tract is, is key, right? That is the largest portion of where all of these immune supporting microbiome live and digest, you know, your digestion, all of this, but we have to also take into consideration our microbiome everywhere. So one thing that is important to consider is like vaginal birth is going to give you a healthier microbiome for your child than say a C-section. So, okay, what happens if you had a C-section? It's fine. We just want that child to be able to build their microbiome and build a diverse microbiome. And so we can't get diverse microbiome from just taking probiotics. We can't even get it from taking fermented foods, right? So we have to consider everything in our world. And so that could be anything from playing with pets to, you know, grounding and earthing, you know, going out and hanging out in the grass, getting your feet in the grass, hang, you know, sitting in dirt or on the sand at the beach, right? All of these things where we're connecting with our environment help our microbiome. What doesn't help our microbiome is our incessant need to put hand sanitizer on, our incessant need to like make sure we are stay away from everything. Um, you know, that's germ theory. Germ theory states that like the germs need to stay out because that's bad. Well, 90% of your body is germs. It's, it's you know, you it's bacteria, it's micro, it's microbes. So when we start to really consider, okay, if I can really pay attention to um, proliferating, right? So like regenerating my good gut, and thinking, okay, what damages it? And then what heals it? So we know what damages it. Pharmaceuticals, stress, lack of sleep, uh, eating poorly, eating a processed diet, <clears throat> uh, doing things where you're having a lot of caffeine, having a highly acidic or even a highly alkaline uh, body makeup, uh, dealing with people who are constantly eating, right? Constantly eating the same things, right? Some of us are so intent on on textures and tastes and we eat the same things over and over again well that's creating a stunted microbiome you, you have very little bio, you know variety and what happens is which is so fascinating is that the lack of variety actually is only because they're not being fed and you're losing countless hundreds if not thousands of species of good healthy microbes they're being extinct in your own body. And so when you take a cross section of humans, you will note that their microbiomes are vastly different. And we can actually pinpoint disease issues in, in groups of people, uh, say these groups of people all are deficient in these certain microbiome, uh, you know, these different probiotics that are good for them to lose weight and they're all overweight. So that's, it's a common thread. These people over here all have, 
you know, this autoimmune disease and it's a common thread. They're missing certain microbiome uh, or they're high in others that are bad. So it's fascinating to get into this. And so, you know, we think, okay, processed things, all the stuff that we, you know, staying away from things, making sure that we're hyper cleaning things, uh, even our foods, right? Foods, if you have an organic, if you have an organic uh, garden, you should just be sort of rinsing it. And when I say sort of, I mean, it's actually okay to leave a little dirt on there. That's part of your healthy microbiome. And so when we don't do that, think of a cow, right? They'll eat the grass and they pull it up by the root sometimes and they eat the dirt and they're okay. I know that we're not cows, but part of that is that's part of, you know, human, as we, as we commercialized our lives, we just have sterilized everything. So think about if you are out, say camping somewhere and you were walking along, you would pick berries. You wouldn't clean them. You'd pick them and there might be some bugs on them and you wouldn't even notice it because you'd eat them. And guess what? That would populate your microbiome in a good way. It would add diversity. So the key, the key, 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 and I'll end on this, the key to a diverse, healthy microbiome is variety in what you're eating. So you can do different uh, probiotics and prebiotics, and you can take supplements that people tell you to take. And I'm, I, you know, take a bunch of them as well, but they're not the key. Okay. The key is not supp supplements. It's not anybody trying to sell you like a brain, a brain gut, like, you know, it's going to do wonders for you. What those do for you are temporary. So like if you have IBS, you can take a probiotic and it can actually help clear that up temporarily, but it's not going to actually, those probiotics that you take in a capsule or powder or anything, those aren't going to proliferate uh, and thrive in like long for longevity. That's not how those work. Th they work for temporary fixes. So like if you're feeling sick, you can like take six probiotics and just knock them back and go to bed. And those are going to go to work right then and there, but then they will die off. Okay. Because they're not meant, they're not native to you. How to create native to you, healthy, dynamic microbiome would be to look at how many fruits and vegetables you're eating every week, uh, daily, even like you got to consider, are you eating five to 10 different vegetables per day? Right. I mean, like who does this? Uh, can you get 30 to 50 different vegetables per week, right? Again, it's really difficult to do, but that's where you need to kind of, you know, look for your farmer's markets that are in the area, especially summer's coming around and you can repopulate your gut right now when the, when this, when the sun starts coming out and things start coming to the market that are fresher, you repopulate your gut right now and you also fast. So if you can get into it, intermittent fasting, doing a 17 hour fast window and then undulate that. So you could do 17 and then 18, 19, 20, then back to 18, 17, you know, like you can just kind of, you can kind of like go back and forth between those time frames between 17 and like 21, 22. And then once a week, do a 24 hour fast. That's going to be really helpful for you for three months because some of you have been on like antibiotic rounds that have decimated your entire microbiome. So that means you, you, you're on a two to three year, if not four year, in some cases rebuild. And this is what you have to do. Some of you are like, oh no, can I just do the fecal transplant? Right? I mean, you can look into it and it's kind of, you know, one of those things where um, people are slowly catching on. It's been around for a long time. Uh, but it's one of those things that people are kind of grossed out by, but it's not, it's, it's something to consider, but that's something where it's key. What I mean by that is your microbiome is key to your overall health and maybe the actual trigger for some issues like we talked about depression, anxiety, um, you know, even diabetes can be linked to your microbiome, uh, getting, you know, autoimmune diseases, uh, dealing with acne, skin issues, psoriasis, like all these things can be linked directly to our microbiome. So you can follow a microbiome diet. There's different phases. Uh, you're eliminating a bunch of stuff and then you're adding certain things. 
but um, realistically, it's it's just removing processed foods. You're repairing the gut wall. You're replacing uh, digestive enzymes and like HCL stomach acids. You're going to get some uh, probiotics and and some um, you know kimchi and things like that that you might want to consume that have a different diversity. So just think diversity and incorporating all those. But um, if we just want to go down a short list of foods to avoid, it would be all grains. I know, uh, for sure, gluten, right? So if you, gluten for sure, but all grains, all dairy, uh, eggs are okay to some degree, but a lot of people would say that could be a problem for your gut. So it just depends. Um, any packaged or processed foods, any fruit juices and sodas and, and sports drinks and all that. Um, corn is another real bad one. Potatoes aren't great. Uh, peanuts in particular, all the other um, nuts are, are pretty good for you, but uh, high fructose corn syrup, obviously artificial sweeteners, all those things can actually um, hinder deli meat, bacon, sorry. Uh, all of those can actually hinder, if not damage your microbiome. So we want to be uh, careful with that. So, all right. I know it's a lot, but hopefully this will give you guys some food for thought to just kind of think in terms of how you would move forward with this. All right. So first question up here is how long do essential oils last if the bottle is open? So my question to you is, do you mean the bottle is open and you've left the cap off? Because that's how I read that sentence. I'm assuming you mean how long do essential oils last once you've opened it and then put the cap back on, right? Like once it's been opened. Um, it depends on the oil. So most oils are indefinite if kept in a cool, dark place. The question there then is what does cool, dark place mean? Cool, dark place is not your home. Your home is not a cool, dark place. I don't care how cold your home gets. If it's, you would be, you would be wrapped up and shivering is what a cool, dark place is in the legal terms of medical community. Okay. So a cool, dark place is your refrigerator. Okay. So just so you know, um, that's a funny, weird thing that people don't understand. They think a cool, dark place means like, I mean, maybe a wine cellar type of situation. But um, outside of that, that it, nothing you have anywhere local in your home is a cool, dark place. So don't think just a shadow area in a, in a drawer somewhere is a cool, dark place. If, if the if the location gets to, you know, in the 70s at all, which is common for most indoor living spaces, uh, that's not a cool place at all. And that will cause oxidation. So indefinitely, most oils. And why I say most is because if it's a cold pressed oil like lemon, uh, orange, like some of the normal cold pressed oils, those last only six months. They actually only last six months, even unopened. So you got to be careful about that one. So those, whenever you have any citrus, any and all citrus, whether they're opened or unopened, must be in your refrigerator. And then outside of that, any expensive oils like frankincense and sandalwood keep in your refrigerator. So you know, we have very large amounts of essential oil now because we buy um, in bulk from original Swiss aromatics and that um, we have them in the refrigerator, like they must be refrigerated. So, you know, that's just keeping them fresh. So I just encourage you to, you know, if you're using them, you can keep them out. Like I have oils all over the place and, you know, we're using them. So of course I'm, I'm using them, but I just consider, you know, small containers. So any of you making your own roll-ons or making your own dropper bottles, keep them in the five mils. If you get into the 10 mil, do like a half a bottle and then use it within a month. So that's the same for roller balls. If you're using roller balls, uh, those only will last for maybe three months if you're lucky because you are oxidizing them with your own skin cells and debris by using a roller ball. So just know that um, don't, like don't put a roller ball on your frankincense. It's a really bad practice unless, and I'm going to say a very quick unless, unless you tend to go through your entire bottle of frankincense in one month with a roller ball on. And when you do use that roller ball, make sure your hands are super clean and very dry before applying it to your fingers and then put it wherever you're trying to put the frankincense. So that just causes the um, essential oil to oxidize the frequency will be completely dead. So those of you guys who follow frequency understanding in oils, uh, that will freak you out for sure. You start touching the orifice reducer or touching the roller ball, 
which you do anyways with a rollerball. That's why I don't use rollerballs. <laughs> um, it, it oxidizes and totally decimates the frequency. So moving forward then with your essential oils, like I said, just keep most of them in your refrigerator and the ones that you're using consistently, you can keep them out. Like my husband uses a roller ball and he goes through that in about a month. So I know it's fine. He is fine. And it's got carrier oil in it and the carrier oil causes oxidation as well. So that's the question of, um, well, what is oxidation? Well, oxidation will make the oil absolutely not work. So the therapeutic qualities will be gone, um, but it will burn. So usually it's an issue where it smells rancid, but it oftentimes just burns. Like you're like, well, that's weird. It, that's not how it normally feels when I put it on my neck, you know? So, uh, so that's, that's how it is. If you are taking it. So there's an interesting kind of school of thought of like, if an oil doesn't smell good to you to just take the cap off and let it sit open for a week. I don't know who came up with that stupid idea, but I'm going to tell you right now it's stupid. I know I tend to talk, I'm a, I'm a red personality. So I tend to use kind of aggressive language and I'm a boy mom. So sorry. Um, but I will tell you, uh, doing that changes the synergy of the oil. It, it's ridiculous. You're taking all, all the top notes and now you're like basically removing a bunch of monoterpenes, which it creates, sure, potentially a really stronger sesquiterpene oil, but you've removed therapeutic qualities. You've basically created a fractionally distilled oil, which are just useless. So let's not get into fractionally distilled oils. It's the worst. So there's only two companies in the United States, one for sure in France that I know of that doesn't fractionally distill. So uh, Florihana is a great brand. They don't fractionally distill. Original Swiss Aromatics is the longest running essential oil company here in the United States. I do know, and I've seen Young Living post that they think that they're the longest brand. They know they're not the longest brand because they came from Original Swiss Aromatics. So Gary Young learned under um, Kurt Schnaubelt, who is still alive and still, you know, working at the helm of Original Swiss Aromatics. Uh, you know, Young Living gives them props that this is like the whole story of Young Living's beginnings, the origin story. So, you know, Young Living doesn't fractionate their oils. They're very good oils. Original Swiss doesn't either. And they've been around longer, uh, 40 years. And, um, and Floriana. So those are three brands that I would say um, are good. Other essential oil companies may be pure, but they're fractionally distilled or they're rectified. And both of those I can't abide by. I, I can abide by them if I'm just trying to make the room smell nice. So like it, locally, we have a company here called Eden's Garden and um, they have really fun Christmas smells and Christmas like, you know, room sprays. So it, I'm not using that for therapeutic use. I know their oils are pure, but I also am very clear that their oils are fractionally distilled. The girls at the front desk don't know that, but they are. Okay. So that's just the, the reality of it. Uh, same with like doTERRA. doTERRA will claim that there aren't, they aren't fractionally distilled or rectified, but they absolutely are. And you can tell just by smelling them. It's a very simple test. We've gone over this multiple times. So, all right, moving on. There are many types of magnesium. Which one is recommended in an electrolyte mix? Okay. So Interestingly enough, um, each electrolyte mix that you look into are, is going to be different. Uh, personally, when we're looking at magnesium, and I'm going to look up one brand of, of uh, electrolyte-like mix here just to see what they use because I actually haven't um, checked because I do know it's isolated. Whenever you are looking at a an actual um, like electrolyte mix that isn't from, say, a pink salt or Himalayan salt or something like that, usually it's just an isolated nutrient. So if you look, it doesn't even say it just says magnesium. Oh, it says magnesium malate. So I personally think that magnesium glyconate is the best one for us to use. If you're using an isolate, an isolated supplement, I'm actually against isolated supplements to, uh, to a certain degree. So I do use them. So I'll use like potassium chloride and magnesium malate and, you know, sodium chloride. Like we use those, right? It's, it's, it just, it happens to be in things that we do. But if you're looking at taking a magnesium supplement, say at night before bed. So usually that's the, the issue. You at night before bed, you know, maybe you have restless leg syndrome. Maybe you can't sleep. You toss and turn. Maybe you get cramps, you know, at night. Uh, you just don't sleep well. So taking a magnesium supplement that is a what's considered a complex is much better. 
And so a complex would be something like a coral magnesium. And that's what I recommend. So personally at night, I use the magnesium. Um, it's the calcium magnesium plus from PRL. Uh, there's a discount going on right now through the 11th. So you guys can get in on that if you want, but um that's just what I use. And so they use coral magnesium and that is from Sango Marine Coral. And the, the deal is, is that it's, it's just from the coral. So you're getting this beautiful complex that has 70 ion, like ionized minerals. So you're getting ionic minerals along with a two to one ratio of um, bioavailable calcium to magnesium. So at night, you actually, that's a good time to take it. So I often will take that with the D3K2 supplement because those, all four of those go really well together for bioavailability. And then you get your, say, turmeric. So that's typically what I take at night. Uh, but as far as the electrolyte question, I mean, it's up to you, right? So Promix is a really good one. It's not as good tasting. So if you are okay with the magnesium malate and you want to see how that feels on you that's the lmnt i do drink that because i like the chocolate one but um i also do the pro mix brand so those are two uh electrolytes that i take so we do have one coming out though so just be aware of that that we will have a an electrolyte coming out through uh life wave so we're excited about that okay and it's within the supplement structure that they have so um <coughs> Okay, so that's the same question underneath. How do we know what type of magnesium our body needs? You really should just do a, what I just talked about. You should do magnesium that is a complex from nature, not something isolated. Uh, all right, what is the best steps to reset your gut if you're having an issue? So Tammy, I ho hope you got on at the beginning. I did a whole talk on resetting your gut. So uh, watch that. It's about 20 minutes long. Okay, after eight weeks of use, we're supposed to stop cortisol for two to four weeks before resuming. How do we know exactly how many weeks to stop in between usage? Okay, so this is just from history. I, you know, used to be with Young Living and was one of their main educators for, oh gosh, I don't even know how many years. I was with them since 2007. So that's a long time um, and 17 years there. And I think maybe eight years educating, seven, eight, seven, eight years educating all of you guys. So, uh, you know, I did my due diligence in really making sure I understood a lot of history. So here's the history. Uh, when Gary created supplements like Cortistop, things that he knew, uh, I think he understood really well how we operate as humans. He was an excellent uh, people person, right? He just, he just had this really great intuition on humans. And one thing that is interesting about us, and I see this in my own practice all over the place, is you all want to know, what do I need to take? Just tell me, tell me what I need to take. And then I will take that for the rest of my life every single day. Like you want to know exactly what you need and you're gonna just be like a machine. I, I don't, I'm not like that because I understand how our body works, but most people are because they just think in terms of medical minded, right? You're medically minded, you're, your thought process is, okay, this is what I need to do. And this is my regimen. And you get on this really tight regimen. The problem with that, when you're dealing with hormones, which Cortistop is a hormone supporting supplement, it has DHEA and pregnenolone in it, which is not considered something you should be on long-term because, because your hormones change. So uh, you'll see that written on multiple supplements, like take this for a certain amount of time and then stop. And then start up again. It's because Gary really wanted you to pay attention, pay attention to what's going on. So for me, when I did use Cortisop, because I'm using X39 patch right now, and it eliminates all the hormone supplements. So I don't have to, I took a bunch of hormone supplements and I don't have to take any of those anymore. And the reason I was good at taking them, the supplements, was because I paid attention to my body. And so sometimes I, I needed more, like I would need Cortistop and Femigen and Progestins Plus, you know, uh, and then other times I just needed PD-80-20. Like there, it was very interesting to like pay attention to your mood swings, pay attention to your hot flashes, pay attention to your hormone changes. And when you see what's going on, 
the only way to see is if you were on for two months and then you stop and you stop for two weeks and then you'll know, right? You'll be like, oh, I don't feel good. Okay, I need to start again. Okay, and then you take it and then take a break. You're seeing where you're at hormonally. Because I would sometimes take a break and be like, oh, I'm good. And then I'd be like two, three, four months off of all those supplements. And then I'd be like, oh, my hormones are shifting again. And I'd have to start taking them again. And so it's just a matter of you paying attention to your hormonal shifts. And, uh, you know, when you're perimenopausal going into menopause and you're just like that whole thing, it things start to snowball pretty quickly. And so you you got to you got to start tracking it. So it's interesting because some people um, misunderstood what Cordostop was for because they read the title. Uh, it's unfortunate. It does not stop cortisol. So people would think, oh, I need to take this if I'm really stressed out and I have adrenal fatigue and I need Cordostop. No, that's like not what it does. Okay. So when you start to understand that DHEA and pregnenolone are precursor hormones, they're just like jumper cables to help your body do the right thing. It helps your body regulate. It doesn't boost or decrease any hormone. Okay. So uh, it's an interesting discrepancy that I think a lot of people misunderstood, but it's a good supplement. Okay. Uh, Melissa says, I'm starting chemo this Friday. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. I know you're having a hard time. Do you have any suggestions for anything to help me during this time, such as supplements or patches or oils or anything else? Uh, I think, I, I don't know your regimen. So most doctors, you know, most oncologists will tell you once we start chemo, you can't do anything else. You you can't do anything that has a high affinity to, toward, an, you know, antioxidants. So you can't do Ninja Red. If you are, you know, a lot of you guys are young living, you can't do Ninja Red. You can't do um, Kiani if you're Amari. You can't do high vitamin C doses. You, you know, you, you, you just, you're off all that. So anything that is a high antioxidant, you actually have to stop because it can interfere with cleansing out the chemo too quickly before it does its work. So, you know, and again, depending on what on oncologist you're working with, hopefully you're working with like an integrative oncologist who is like quarter dosing your chemo. Um, but again, everybody's got a different person and different reasons for going to different people. But uh, once usually it's a, it's a 24 to 48 hour cycle. So basically that means that you would go in and I don't, again, everybody's on a different plan. So I don't know what your plan is, but let's say you go in for your chemo. You just, your day of chemo, you've got to wait. Like there's like 48 hours. Usually it's like 24 to 48 hours. So, you know, you can decide to truncate that if you want to. So 24 hours before and 24 hours after. So there's a two day window that you cannot do anything like no supplements you just got to stop and then on when your 24 hours is up after let's say you got chemo you know it stopped at at, at 10 o'clock in the morning and then it, by 10 o'clock the next morning you go crazy with supplements and things literally you want to even go to like an iv you want to get you know vitamin c an iv drip on vitamin c and you're doing high dose it's for chemo patients it's not a normal don't go just like an, a normal iv therapy place uh ozone therapy you're doing all sorts of things like you know you're fasting doing lemon water you're eating no sugar no grains like everything you do is like clean and it's a lot it's a lot but that's the biggest deal like you can no longer have grains you can no longer have any sugar at all uh, literally you are, um, you know, eating tons and tons and tons and tons of variety of color of fruits and vegetables, but limiting fruits that are, uh, hybridized, you know, you're limiting things like that. You're not eating bananas, right? There are certain like pineapples out, like there are certain things that just your body reads as a candy bar and you don't want to feed the cancer cells. So you're trying to kind of limit all of that. Um, but then at that point you could put on like the glutathione patch. You can wear X39 patch. That's up to you that you can wear those. You can wear patches through your treatment. Um, there's a misunderstanding of, of understanding. Um, let's see, uh, you know, company and, and practitioner specifically like somebody telling you as a cancer patient, 
that you cannot, that you, that you can do something, right? So like, I wouldn't be able to tell you, you should do this because that would be me stepping into your doctor's shoes, which I'm not. So that's something that's really important that you need to understand that uh, the company says no patches during cancer treatments because of liability. And that's all. Uh, my very best friend who is right now pretty much cancer free you guys um support her and her and like you guys minister to her in crazy ways because you guys who purchase uh, norwex use her link so i appreciate that uh next month we're gonna we're gonna give out free face uh cloths to people so that'll be kind of a fun thing i i try to take my earnings from that and and then dole it out to you guys in anything that you guys buy from us so uh, that's something that she wore X39 through the whole thing. And then she would wear the glutathione patch pretty much every day that she was like outside of her 48 hour window. So those are some things to consider. So Eon X39, you can wear during and then glutathione, Eon and X39 outside of that. And then just you can start oiling, diffusing, get your stress levels down. You can start you know, start your supplements back up, all the things that are going to help chelate out. So chlorella is a really important one, something that has dark leafy greens in the capsules, those kind of things that just kind of help flush your body. Uh, but that's it. So I know um, you'll do great. I, I just think, you know, a lot of prayer and a lot of calm. I think that's another thing. Like if you can, you know, look at this as an opportunity for you, for your body to learn, for you to, you know, get really healthy, because that's an interesting thing too. When you're going through, uh, chemo and, and you've chosen maybe a, a specific path because there are specific like kind of like I said integrative paths uh, you get really wildly healthy so because you get really laser focused on not wanting to feed that those cancer cells so that's part of the um, mind shift too so it's really an interesting thing so yeah okay uh, Kimberly's asking about the berberine and the Xanax, um, or Panax, um, ginseng. And I, you know, she put a picture up and asked how, what did she say? Sorry, I lost the picture. How much are you taking of these two for weight loss and which brands are you, are your favorite? Well, that was my photo. So the photo I posted that you posted, that's my photo. So those are the brand, that's the brands I'm using. So, uh, I, and I base it on the, the capsule and it just depends. Like I think the Panex ginseng is uh, Zo Lotus is the brand. I, I got it on Amazon. I read whenever I can't find something that I want in PRL, it's um, I read tons of reviews. So this has a lot of other things in it, but I wanted those things like green tea, ashwagandha. Um, I forget the other things that are in there, but you got to make sure that you're okay taking those things. Okay. So there's other things in there and you only take them in the morning. So I think it's two and then the berberine, it just depends on um, the dosage on the bottle, but it's two, usually two on that one as well. Uh, but that one is uh, straight from Costco. That's where I found that one and it's a good one. And then there's one on Amazon that's another good one. Uh, and so you can just look again, you're looking for high absorption berberine. I know some people out there, you guys have probably heard some talk and ch chatter about berberine not working. I'm like, that's totally wrong. There's some really great studies on berberine helping lower blood glucose, uh, helping with your cholesterol levels. So, you know, we don't, we just do the best we can. And I have found that they've worked really well so far for me. I'm also taking um, Acromansia, I can't, I'm totally pronouncing that wrong, but Acromansia, I think it's called. It's a probiotic. And then I'm taking, again, this is just because I'm, I'm working toward um, not eating. I'm not eating, I'm eating, not eating sugar. And I've been off grains. I'm very, very, very small, like under 10% amount of grains per day. Uh, and that's, and specific grains at that, but that's because I'm noticing that um, my body chemistry doesn't do well as my hormones are changing with grains. So there's that. And that's something to consider too, that, you know, most of us women going through menopause as our hormones change, we actually can't eat the same way that we used to. So, uh, so, but that's a good question. Okay. I have a friend who just was just diagnosed with a uh, bullos pem figiod, pem, whatever. It's the little sores all over. I can't ever pronounce that word, but um, pemphi. Pemphigioid, pemphig, 
pemphigoid, pemphigoid. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Anyhow, um, pemphigoid, maybe that's it, pemphigoid. So um, bilis, pemphigoid is an autoimmune, autoimmune issue. And it, um, interestingly, people think that it just happens as you get older, but it happens because people are on a lot of NSAIDs and medications and are eating poorly. And part of the problem is that doctors will tell you you can't reverse it and that you need to get on steroids and it's a mess. Uh, you can die from it. So that's something that I want to tell you guys right now. Um, all of that can be reversed. You have to 100% change your diet. Like how we were talking about when you have cancer, like you have to, all this stuff, no more grains, like no more grains. If you want to get rid of all of these sores all over your body, like in your mouth, I mean, they, they, they kind of come up everywhere. You absolutely need to make a change. And so it's, and it's fixable. So, I mean, there's people that say you can like rub aloe vera on whatever. Uh, there, there was one study that was pretty compelling on this about berberine. We just talked about berberine. Uh, berberine topically, rubbing berberine on them topically helped heal them up. So that's an interesting thing too, but you have to change your diet. So we have to stop feeding the autoimmune issue. Uh, and so that's um, just, again, something to consider. So, uh, and I'm going to drop down to this question. Um, 17 year old just got an ANA test positive range in, in you know, 140 and then um, not diagnosed yet with autoimmune. And then she's wanting to know any way to reverse the ANA, ANA. Well, those if they didn't go beyond the 140, so what they do is they test you for these antibodies and, and it, it, it's a one to 40 ratio. And then they take, if you have, if you have them markers, they take that and they make it like a one to 80 ratio. And if you still have markers, they take that and they take it to, uh, they literally double down, double down, double down. And they're making this high dilution and they can get as far as like in the one to 2000 something, right? It's huge. And if you still have markers, you, you definitely have an autoimmune. Now those tests can't tell you which autoimmune you have. It just tells you that you have autoimmune markers. The problem with those tests and that you're afraid now is, is not really important unless they went on to do it, it, like, okay, all of us, m like most people going in for an ANA test would have some positive range in, in, in many cases, just because it happens sometimes. It's just, you know, so unless the doctor saw enough in there to feel we need to do a one, a, a one to 80 test, not just a one to 40, we need to go further. If they didn't do that, then you're fine. Okay, so just just like calm down. But the question then is, okay, we don't want we don't want to even get into that. So how do we just clean them up? So so that's a good way to scare scare a seventeen year old, right? And you said she has fatigue, and that's the other thing they look for. They look for markers. Like, okay, you're here, you've got some positive markers, but do you have any physical markers? And and fatigue in a seventeen year old, headache in a seventeen year old, vertigo is not as common, but but vertigo is not necessarily something that would be associated with a, like generally like autoimmune disorders. I mean, so that's something where it could just be an inner ear issue uh, and the fatigue and the headaches can be that as well. But here's what you do. I, as a mom, if this was my kid, I would use this. I would manipulate this. I, I know that sounds crazy, but I would because it's a really excellent opportunity for you to help her understand health and how to baseline fix herself. All right. What triggers autoimmune issues? Processed foods, processed food colorings, additives, things that are, um, you know, high fructose corn syrup, uh, excitotoxins like MSG and all the things that you think are just normal because you grew up with whatever, those are all out. Now you get into grains and processed foods and packaged foods and all of the things that you put in the microwave and the things that 17 year olds just eat. She can't eat any of that anymore. And you tell her why. It's not that you're depriving her. You tell her we're taking away the poison. That's where these autoimmune diseases are coming from is the poison in our gut and the poison just in our livers and our bodies and how our bodies are processing things. So she needs to drink a lot of water. She needs to stop coffee. 
She needs to stop like all the things that are triggers and typical triggers for autoimmune would be anything with food coloring in it, anything with um, high fructose corn syrup in it, anything that, uh, you know, part of it is like her electrolytes are probably totally off. So she needs to get better magnesium. So maybe taking a magnesium salt bath, you know, like Epsom salts. But part of that is, is really paying attention to what she's eating. And this is a good a good chance to maybe, maybe she's afraid. Maybe she's like, oh no, what does this mean? You know, and if she's got fatigue and headache, I, I can almost, I bet she's drinking coffee. It's co very common for that age group. They start at like 14 and they think it's great to go to Starbucks like before school at 14. I, uh, you know, luckily Jacob never got into that, but, but that causes fatigue and headache, just drinking coffee. So, um, and vertigo, that can be a problem there too. So Anyhow, hopefully that helps. Um, okay, let's move on. So I have acid reflux for a while now. I'm on meds for it, and I take at least six to 10 megatums per day. Any suggestions on what I can do? I already have the head of my bed raised, and it doesn't help. Okay, so I wouldn't even recommend any of that. Number one, you have to get off of all those tums. And number two, you have to change your diet and take an HCL supplement. So oftentimes what happens this is kind of weird because you think, okay, well, I have... Um, I, I'm getting GERD. I'm getting this like acid reflux and I, it's very uncomfortable. Well, it's your body's, your body's digestive system. Uh, oftentimes that means it's too slow. So what happens is <clears throat> you swallow food and you have this like, like circular, like muscle flap. And it's like the sphincter, at the bottom of your esophagus. And you're like, it opens, goes into your stomach and then it closes. Well, if your digestive system is working too slow because you don't have enough digestive juices, stomach acid, which is usually the problem. <clears throat> it's going too slow. And so then this GERD happens, this kind of opening of the flap, because it, it, it's it's really wild. And then you get acid. In, so you think, well, it's an acid problem. So aren't I supposed to be placating the acid with the Tums? No, you're actually ruining everything. So stop the Tums. What you're going to do is eat smaller portions. But whenever you do eat, you're going to consume like when you're three or four bites into your meal, you know, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to eat a meal. So when you're about, you know, three to five minutes into your meal, you're going to take an HCL supplement. And pepsin is another one that you can take with that. But HCL is the most important one because you're adding some stomach acids to help speed up your digestive tract so that it doesn't cause this acid reflux, so that you're actually able to digest this, this food. The other thing you may be deficient is in is B vitamins. And if you have any like MTHFR issue with a, you know, methylation issue, <clears throat> your B vitamins aren't getting, they're not, they're not operating properly. So what happens is the B vitamins that you are taking aren't doing anything. So you need to take hyper like methylated ones. So that's where understanding like what to take, when to take it, how your body's um, kind of processing foods and, and digesting them, but then also potentially some digestive enzymes. So those are the keys. So, you know, and even possibly some probiotics, but for your actual, uh, you know, acid reflux, no more Tums, no more water with your, with your, when you're eating, you stop drinking water. You guys are drinking way too much water or or any kind of liquid with your food. So when you're eating, if you're having a full meal, four ounces should be all that you pour and you should sip that and, and try not to even drink all of that. And then as you're you know eating, like I said, you take that HCL, maybe also a pepsin supplement, you're taking those. And then you're taking some digestive enzymes, and taking B vitamins in the morning. So this is important for you guys to kind of hear that we have to help your, your digestive system speed up a little bit. So the opposite though, is if you're highly acidic. And so the way to find this out, and we can get into like reams testing and all of that, but the way to figure this out is to do um, in the morning when you wake up a spit test and a urine test onto some pH strips. And you're checking to see the pH balance of your spit to your urine over multiple days. And, you know, 6.5 is where you should be. And so if you are much more acidic in your spit and in your urine uh, versus like uh, alkaline, then we start getting into understanding, okay, well, which is where, and, and you have to like look at the whole picture. So that's too much to get into right now. 
but um, that's, uh, you know, you've got an interesting issue that you're actually causing. So it's interesting because we always think like, oh, well, Tums, no, no, no. Like that's actually exacerbating the problem. Okay, uh, Penny didn't ask a question. I don't know. Do you just want me to talk about parasites? They're great. And coffee enemas, all of you have parasites. Uh, some of you can do coffee enemas if you want. Some of you don't need to. It helps your liver, helps, uh, you, you know, your body clean out. You can just do a colonic if you want, but coffee enemas are great. You can go to my website, jenosullivan.com, and there, I think on there, there's some instructions, I think, for parasites and coffee enemas. Even in, the, in our group, um, the Ask Dr. Jen on Facebook, uh, we have a whole parasite cleanse. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do with parasites and it's fun. It's really fun to get into trying to understand that some things are parasite related. So if we're just talking about parasites in general, uh, you know, we talked about gut health and parasites are technically part of your microbiome. Like we've got some that are, you know, even, a, I mean, this is kind of weird, but like when you start thinking about a parasite, even like a unborn baby in the belly is a parasite, right? It's eating off of you. So uh, but how do we determine the bad parasites and the things that we don't want uh, and things that maybe are burrowed in and how do we get those out? And so this is a longer discussion. Uh, so we've talked about this before, but maybe we can bring it up um, next week because this is a longer topic. And then coffee enemas is also um, fun and you can, there's some instructions in this group. So you can check that out. Uh, okay. I keep my LifeWave patches in the sleeves in a fishing box. The room never gets higher than 70. Now that the summer is here, it will hit the 80s. So yeah, you don't want to keep them in there. You can keep them in the refrigerator. Um, some people will take like an airtight sealed bag and stick them in the refrigerator. Uh, so that's something that you can do. Yeah. And if you've got a lot of, I mean, I have a ton of patches, but our home, we don't, it doesn't get warmer in this one area. We have one area in our home that would be like our wine cellar if we had wine. And it, that's where I have all my patches. So uh, as long as you're 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 not getting in the 80s. So if you're getting in the 80s, you don't want to have um, your patches just kind of laying around. Uh, I know some of you who live like maybe in Arizona have a lot of very um, potential problems with heat, with oils and patches. So uh, hopefully that helps. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I'm not fielding the online one. So if there were any questions on the Dr. Jen page, um, so you please follow me on Dr. Jen O'Sullivan. Uh, that's the only place I can do live videos, but then I will pull it from there and pull it into the Ask Dr. Jen group so that you guys can have them. But uh, yeah, this was fun. Hopefully this was helpful for you. We had a lot of interesting discussions tonight. You can invite your friends. We're gonna do this Tuesdays with Jen uh, moving forward. 5 p.m. Pacific. So I'll see you guys next Tuesday. And that's it for tonight. All right. Take care, everyone.